Welcome everybody to this evening's webinar. We're going to talk about mare and stallion health, preparing them for breeding, what's going to set you up for success. Um, you may be listening to this as a recording later on, but right now it's November and we want to be proactive about the upcoming breeding season. And some of these supplements, if we're feeding you know, a stallion something for semen quality, we want to make sure that we're <clears throat> at least 60 days on a product in order for it to take full effect. So we're right in time if we're going to start the breeding season early, early in January. Um, I know it seems so far away, but really this year has flown by. Uh, but just know that no matter what time of the year you may be listening back to this, it is uh, always better to be prepared and be proactive when setting your horse up for success. So whether it be the competition season, whether it be foaling season, whether it be breeding season, um, start to think about that a couple of months prior. And as a dealer, start to think about don't think about what's happening now. Okay, now it's July and it's hot. I should be selling electrolytes. No, two months prior to that, we need to be selling electrolytes because we know that that's coming and we want people to have their horses already on those products prior to um, that event occurring. So obviously the goal of any breeding program is a healthy foal. Um, and we have mare who's going to carry that foal, stallion who's going to, you know, give half of his genetics. But really, in my opinion, um, the mare has a, a lot more control over the outcome of that foal. Uh, genetically, she's going to give 50% of her genetics. But then when it comes to how those genetics are displayed, we call that the phenotype. So the genotype is just straight up the genetics, 50-50 mare stallion. But the phenotype is how those genetics are going to be expressed. So if the mare is a crazy mare and she never lets the foal lay down or nurse, then he's going to be thinner and not get a great start. And even though he might have the genetics to be a big, healthy, strong boned foal, um, she's just not going to let him show that through her her behavior and her characteristics. We also know that you know, you've heard the old saying of, oh, you know, that trait must have been passed down from your mother or um, or your grandmother. And now we know that that is 100% true. We know that genetics are passed down, but also when it comes to the microbiome, gut health, we know that that is also 100% directly passed down to um, the offspring as well, whether it be humans, dogs, cats, and foals. So having good gut health you know, I say always no gut, no horse. Um, having good gut health is also really important for the outcome of that foal because that's really where they're going to get the first bacteria from. And if that, that gut health is compromised or not as good as it could be, then that's going to go straight to the foal. So think about it, that as well. It's not something we often think about, but our outcome is a quality foal genetically and phenotypically. So if we talk about the mare, Reproductive success is influenced by lots of different factors, some we can't control. Um, day length, we can't, we, you think, oh, well, we can't control day length, but we can because we can put them under light. So we can use kind of those masks that have the uh, light, the Equaloon masks, that's one of the brands, and they have a little light that goes over one eye. Um, nutrition, obviously, if she's overweight or underweight, that is going to affect uh, her ability to get pregnant. And I, I've gone into so many barns and it's kind of the idea in other livestock species, the fatter, the better, right? Fat is a good color. It's not. Uh, we know that in human nutrition, especially women that are going through, um, women that are going through IVF, so fertility treatment, uh, they must be at a certain body weight, uh, BMI. They can't be over a certain BMI. Um, so we know that in mares, especially, uh, they won't cycle properly. They'll hold on to, if you're familiar with breeding mares, they'll hold on to the corpus luteum, um, and continue to produce progesterone, which signals to the mare that you're pregnant. So if she didn't get pregnant, um, she's not going to continue to cycle so that you can take her back to the stallion and rebreed her. So, uh, that can be a real challenge if she's overweight. If she's underweight, then you've got to think about, uh, reproduction is a luxury and 
they're just going to survive first. And if they're not fat enough or they don't have, I shouldn't say fat enough, if they don't have enough body condition, then they also won't cycle. Um, we see that in elite level uh, kind of marathon runners, women that have very little body fat will not cycle. Um, presence of a stallion, uh, age of mare and stallion. I know older, older animals, older horses, older uh, people, it's much more difficult to get pregnant. Um, presence of a stallion. Now, that that is, uh, these days we do so much artificial breeding that potentially a stallion uh, around isn't that important. But I do know I have cattle um, as, and it is important that the uh, heifers, the young heifers especially that are not, um, have not gone through a cycle, have not been bred before, um, have some interaction with um, either, not a stallion if it's a, it's a heifer, but um, other more male uh, behaviors and characteristics. So infection, reproductive success would be um, significantly decreased if there's a uterine infection. Disease, stress, hormones. Now, we talk a lot about um, stress in horses and how everything stresses horses. And when we go into a state of stress, anything that would be a luxury goes away, right? Because when we're in a state of stress, we're just in survival mode. Remember, I always say horses are fight or flight animals. And when they're in that state of stress, they're in that flight mode. I, I, I'm, I'm, I've got high cortisol. I have got to do everything I can. I'm using, I'm keeping all of my energy ready to run, ready to run away from predators. So I'm not putting extra energy into um, laying down extra body fat so that I could get pregnant. Uh, hormones get completely out of sync when they're stressed. So reproductive hormones, estrogen, follicle stimulating hormone, GnRH, all of these hormones that are really important for a, a correct estrus and you know, follicular and estrus cycle, they, that won't happen. Um, one of the things that we have in, our, in some of our products is chromium. And we've talked about chromium in the DAC metabolic because it helps horses with insulin resistance, upregulate those, those glucose receptors. But uh, we know that Chromium will significantly decrease cortisol. Cortisol is a measure of stress. So that's one other way that we can help decrease stress, decrease the kind of symptom of stress in our horses is adding, cortis adding chromium to the diet in something like the DAC metabolic. So factors that are in in nutrition that are affecting uh, mare nutrition mare for fertility okay so body condition too fat too thin both of those protein quality and quantity are we do we have a balanced diet mineral intake vitamin intake um, and then digestive inefficiency okay if we have um, an unhealthy hindgut so the microbiome all those bugs aren't healthy then the vast majority of the horse's diet, which is hay, is not being broken down and absorbed readily. Or if we have hindgut ulcers or this leaky gut issue occurring in the hindgut, then that that food that we're feeding them is not being absorbed um, adequately. When I ask people, when is the most important time to feed a broodmare? A lot of them will say it's in the third trimester of pregnancy. No, the beginning first important time to feed a broodmare is before she ever leaves your farm and goes to the breeding shed um, because we want to make sure that she has balanced vitamins and minerals, adequate protein and quality of protein and those are all going to increase her reproductive efficiency, improve her fertility. Things like vitamin A, selenium and the source of selenium, not just selenium but the source of selenium um, will significantly increase her her ability to get pregnant, her reproductive efficiency or her fertility. So, you know, maybe you've got an overweight mare, your client has an overweight mare and they think, oh, I don't really need to feed it anything yet. I mean, I don't need to feed it DAC Orange or Breeders' Choice Plus. I, I, I don't even have a lick tub out there. Um, they're just getting hay and grass and they look great. 
They might look great, but the only thing you can tell by whether they look fat um, or have good flesh is how many calories they've been eating. Been eating. That's that's it. Um, that says nothing about their selenium status or their copper or zinc status. So just remember that it's really important for reproductive efficiency. So before the broodmare even gets pregnant, that she's on a balanced vitamin and mineral profile. Now, uh, I had a question the other day about, you know, when uh, always we think of um, Breeders' Choice Plus for broodmares. And absolutely, it is, the, it, it's exactly what should be fed to broodmares. But then, you know, feeding, feeding horses is actually really easy. It's, we have to make sure that we're fitting into the budget and management of our clients as well. So let's say a farm has 30 horses and they're all eating DAC orange and we've decided to um, breed two mares. So we've got two mares out of our 30. Um, and now we're going to buy a whole nother bag of vitamin and mineral supplement just for them. Now, some people might be totally fine with that, and that's great. But if they have DAC orange already, then DAC orange would also work for those mares. Um, the only time I would say let's really stick to the Breeders' Choice Plus uh, is if the mares have had difficulty getting pregnant in the past because it's higher in selenium and vitamin A, and we know that those really improve um, reproductive efficiency and help with infertility, then I would lean towards that. But when you're making, uh, helping people make decisions about which products to buy, there's a perfect product for every situation. And then there's a realistic product for every situation, right? And the realistic scenario also takes into account their budget and their management. So calories. Um, like we said, too fat, too thin. Calorie con primary, we, we really need to know um, <clears throat> if a horse is too thin and they're looking at you and saying, I, I want to buy DAC oil because I need to put weight on them. Well, again, you need to look at the whole diet and say, well, tell me what type of hay are you feeding and how much are you feeding? And if we're feeding, you know, 10 pounds of a really local poor grass hay, that's not really cutting it. And you should encourage them to feed uh, a better quality hay and more of it because there's only so much oil you can feed to a horse every day. And at two cups a day, that's kind of when you're going to max out on the amount of oil you can feed to put weight on a horse. That may, you know, that's going to put significant weight on a horse, but maybe they can't afford it. Maybe, um, you know, the horse doesn't want to eat that much or they can't break it up over three meals. So always look at the rest of the diet as well. Look at what hay they're feeding. Um, do they have access to pasture? And if we're breeding early, early in the season, then probably not because there's no pasture available. Um, what what grain are they feeding? Are they, um, you know, just doing a, a local meal mix? What's the calorie content of the grain? Is there an ideal weight for for reproduction? And unfortunately, in horses, you know, we don't have an ideal weight. Uh, we do have an ideal weight for, you know, BMI for a certain height and weight for, for humans, but we have not established an ideal body weight for horses. And really, we don't talk about body weight as much as we talk about body condition, because body weight doesn't really take into account the body fatness or the readiness to, um, to take on pregnancy or reproduction. So we can use body condition score and we can visually assess these horses. And, and this is across the board. Body weight doesn't really take into account um, body fatness. And, you know, I could say the horse is a thousand pounds. Oh, and in your mind, you think, oh, great, that's that's average size horse. No, it's a thousand pounds and it's a mini. So it's morbidly obese or it's a thousand pounds and it's a Belgian. So it's super, super skinny. So everything in perspective and body condition score is a better kind of guide of um, nutritional adequacy, I guess, or, or body fatness. Um, and, and visually, we don't need a scale. Ideally, we want the per same person to visually assess all the horses um, or do it each time. And maybe you have a couple, if you've got a lot of horses in a barn, you 
you have a couple of people, body condition score them all, and then you kind of average the numbers. But um, it's important to, if we have five people in a room and we all body condition score the same horse, we'll all probably have a slightly different number. Um, so it's important that that same person continues to do it. If you're not familiar with the body condition score, it's a one to nine scale that we use here in America with the low numbers being really thin and the high numbers being really fat. And ideally what we do is we take a, um, a if you were gonna do this really scientifically, all of these letters here over the neck, withers, ribs, we would assign them each a, a body condition score and then we would average them all out. But we don't do that in, you know, out in the field. In our mind, we kind of take an estimate of all of them. But one thing that is important to point out is it is important to stand back and look at the whole horse. It's very easy to <clears throat> focus on certain areas. Like if we look at the top line or we look at the ribs, it's very easy to focus on those um, and not see the big picture and see, you know, I've, I've worked with an older horse once that you could see, you know, he, he had started losing his top line a little and you could see the ribs right along the top here, but he also had a giant crest and these two huge fat pads beside his tail. But they kept telling me he was thin based on, you know, I can see a little top line and a little ribs at the top. Well, really that was just muscles, muscle wasting because he was 29 years old and not doing any exercise. So um, make sure that you're taking a holistic approach and looking at the whole horse. So this horse is a body condition score of two and you can see the ribs, you could feel the ribs. Um, and this is too thin. Three, again, we can see more even coverage over the horse. And it's really the best if you can put your hands on the horse, but you can still see the ribs and this horse is still too thin. Now we get to a body condition score of four. This is kind of the lower end where some mares will get pregnant, some mares won't. I prefer to see them at a five or a six. Once we start to get into a seven, eight, or even a nine, which I don't have here, that's overweight, obese, and you're going to start to struggle to get them pregnant. We're gonna to have to start to have those issues with um, reproductive cycling not occurring. Uh, so a three or less, we can we consider this horse as underweight, right? Really need to put some weight on this horse before we even take them to the breeding shed. And uh, you can probably put about 50 pounds on a horse in about 60 days. So again, if you want to breed this horse in early January, you got to start now. And if you live in Wisconsin, it's already cold there, so it's an uphill battle uh, when it's cold. So you need to make sure that you're really giving, you're setting yourself up for success and giving yourself enough time to achieve these goals. And as a dealer or as someone selling these products, you need to do that as well because the last thing you want is for someone to turn around and say, well, it, you know, you sold me this product and it didn't work. Well, I sold you this product with five days to try and get a horse fat enough to breed her and that was just never gonna happen. So that was an unrealistic expectation um, and you fall flat on your face and nobody's a winner at that point. So make sure that you are very honest with your clients about how long things take. It takes about 50, uh, 60 days to put about 50 pounds on a horse. So if someone says, oh, feed this oil or feed this supplement that's going to put 100 pounds on your horse overnight, you know, that's just a straight up lie and will never happen. Uh, four to a six can be considered ideal. I prefer a five or a six, but you know, a four in certain breeds, uh, Arabians, for example, thoroughbreds that are all already a little leaner. Um, this, they may just get pregnant totally fine. Uh, maybe a quarter horse that was a four may not have as much luck because they do carry a little bit more weight typically. But anyway, I, I like them right in the middle at a five or a six, but um, four to a six is considered ideal. Seven, eight, nine, we're going to start to run into issues with um, reproductive fertility going down because of what I said. They're going to hold on to that CL. They're not going to cycle properly. They're going to think they're pregnant, and then you're not going to be able to rebreed her. Just like changing a body condition score up or down, it takes about 40 to 50 pounds. So we want to take her from a four to a five, a five to a six, or a seven down to a, a six. 
we want to make sure that we give adequate amount of time. And it's changing a body condition score, like I said, is going to take between 40 and 50 pounds of gain or loss um, to make that happen. Now, what, what we don't want to do is be losing weight when we're trying to get her pregnant. So again, set, your, set the horse up for success by getting it in the correct body condition score and at least be maintaining or increasing when you take her to the breeding shed or you try to uh, you know, synchronize her to do AI. If we're in this, what we consider ideal body condition score, that five to six, uh, we have decreased services per pregnancy. So, you know, we're not having to buy multiple straws or if you're shipping a horse away to another farm, to where the stallion stands or where they're going to be collected and inseminated, then you don't have to have her there as long. You know, for a lot of us, horses are a hobby. I just want to get her pregnant. I'll do whatever I can. But for, an, uh, you know, another vast majority, this is a business. And if I'm sending horses away to a stallion and I am paying for them to be boarded there every day um, and it's taking two, three cycles to get her pregnant, then we're, we're already in the negative before the foal's even born. Um, so if she's a two thin, uh, really a two to a four. Um, if she's maintaining or losing weight, that's a problem. If we get to the beginning of the breeding season and she's a four, and we're like, oh, we really want to have her increasing. Four is not ideal, but we want to have her increasing. Then having her on an increasing plane of nutrition increasing in the increase from a four to a five um, in that time that we take her to the breeding shed would help. Now, um, what would you use? Uh, things like the DAC oil, the DAC bloom, um, making sure you've done something like the DAC DDA so that the other feed that you're feeding is, is being fully utilized. Good quality hay, plenty of hay, high fat, high fiber type feed, or just a high calorie feed in general. Um, will drive her body weight up. <clears throat> if she's too fat, we'll have to see these hormonal imbalances, insulin resistance with all switch and, and chronic inflammation. So <clears throat> obesity leads to chronic inflammation and chronic inflammation is the root of all bad things. And if we have an inflamed uterus, not going to, it's not gonna, it's not going to um, be a, what's the word, a great place for that embryo to implant. So we might have problems with implantation um, of that embryo. We see laminitis, poor rebreeding because of the hormonal imbalances. <clears throat> so if we have a horse that's too fat, again, we need to decrease her body weight. But you don't want to decrease her body weight right when you're trying to get her pregnant. Because if she's on a decline, declining plane of nutrition and you send her to AI or to, to be live covered, it's not going to work out very well. So you wanna set her up for success before the breeding season, before you ever think about breeding her, you wanna put her in the right body condition. Uh, you don't wanna do it <clears throat> if she's going through lactation and you're rebreeding her again, you wouldn't want to try and put her on a diet then because she would again be on a on a decreasing plane of nutrition. And that means, look, food sources, food is running out. I cannot get pregnant again. I need to store everything I can and maintain. Immediately after breeding her, no, because that, in that 30-day window post-breeding, any changes you make um, can be, that's when the the embryo is the most uh, volatile and, and it's early embryonic loss is at its highest. Um, at weaning, once pregnant, so we're like <clears throat> a few months into pregnancy at that point, maybe we're four or five months into pregnancy, um, that's when you could decrease her body weight. And it kind of fits the whole program anyway. We're decreasing her calorie intake because we're cutting, we want her to decrease her milk output or stop her milk output. Um, so that's a good time to do that. 
So feeding the obese horse, how do we do that? I mean, I, I think feeding a fat horse is way harder than feeding a thin horse. Feeding a thin horse, you just feed it and feed it and feed it and feed it higher calories and feed it more, uh, feed it oil, that kind of thing. But feeding a fat horse becomes very difficult because there's only, as we've just seen, like, when am I going to take the weight off this horse? Uh, she's pregnant and she's in early pregnancy or I'm trying to get her pregnant. Like, when can I do this? Um, so it becomes difficult. And then as you decrease intake, uh, then you can be, you've got to be really careful that you don't run into other issues like um, uh, gastric ulcers or colic or behavioral problems because we've really decreased and, and restricted her diet. Um, and I, always, I also say just, there's only so much you can restrict intake and restrict calories before you really do damage. So increasing extra energy expenditure by exercising them. Can you lunge them? Can you ride them? Um, can you do forced exercise in a field by <clears throat> putting the water trough at one corner, the gate where they come in and out at another corner, putting the hay in another corner, putting the feed or the salt block or the supplement in another corner? So <clears throat> can you force them to exercise by doing something like that? Also, in the wintertime, don't put a blanket on them. <laughs> it will make them decrease body weight. <clears throat> So what's in the Breeders' Excel and the Breeders' Choice Plus? I guess I'll skip and say Breeders' Choice Plus, and then we'll come back to the Breeders' Excel because the Breeders' Excel is a little bit more of a um, specialty product. The Breeders' Choice Plus is a straight-up vitamin and mineral supplement. We talked about it earlier. When do I do this versus other vitamin and mineral supplements? The Breeders' Choice Plus is ideal for broodmares and stallions. Um, so if your farm, if, if the farm has a breeding operation and that's what they primarily do, then Breeders' Choice Plus should be, be their, their staple, their foundation vitamin and mineral supplement. If, that, if they only have a couple of broodmares and they have a lot of horses that are on the DAC Orange or the Total Performance um, or the Total Performance Plus, then those products will also be fine. We'll, we'll give her all the vitamins and minerals she needs um, throughout throughout pregnancy and lactation. But ideally, Breeders Choice Plus, higher selenium content, higher vitamin A, and <clears throat> that's going to help with fertility. So if we have a horse that we've struggled to get pregnant, then I would always lean towards the Breeders Choice Plus. The Breeders Excel does not replace your vitamin and mineral supplement. So if you're feeding orange or you're feeding total performance or you're feeding Breeders' Choice Plus and somebody says, well, you should try the Breeders' Excel, it's not to replace one of those other products, right? It's in addition. This is a specialized vitamin E and omega-3 fatty acid supplement that we know, especially in stallions, is going to improve um, semen quality and semen health. <clears throat> in mares, it's been shown to improve ovarian function, ovarian quality, oocyte quality, egg quality, and it also helps to decrease inflammation. So if we have that obese mare who's got chronic inflammation because she's fat and we're working on the body weight, we're adding chromium to try and help her um, with her stress levels because again, if she's fat, she's also stressed, then the Breeders Excel will also help decrease that whole body inflammation um, and increase her chances of getting pregnant. So the Breeders Excel, not every mare needs to have it. It's not just every every brood mare should be on it. Um, if budget allows, there is a lot of research saying that it improves brain and lung development in uh, the fetus. Uh, that's in, that's human research as well as horse research. Uh, but again, if if the budget does not allow it, then make sure they're doing a vitamin and mineral supplement first. And if we have a mare that we're really struggling to get pregnant and we're trying everything nutritionally um, as well as other therapies to get her pregnant, then the Breeders' Choice Plus and the Breeders' Excel combined would be ideal. Now, for stallions to improve semen quality, we're looking at a minimum of 60 days prior to the first intended date of breeding. So again, if you want to breed in January, we need to start the Breeders' Excel now, hence why it's on sale now. Um, and they get a pound a day of this, 16 ounces a day. The broodmares, uh, it's a half a pound, it's eight ounces a day. And again, I, I would like to see them 
feed it 60 days prior because, you know, you're not just going to decrease inflammation overnight. This isn't a drug, um, but at least 30 days for a broodmare if you want to try it. With that, I will take any questions.